Hello guys, welcome to Klaus Gaming. Today we're going to check out the beginner's guide. This game just landed on Steam. I had no idea it was coming. <laughs> if I had, I would have requested a key or something like that. Yeah, so it was off my radar and it just landed and it looks really interesting. It's from uh, Davy Raiden, who also made the Stanley Parable, which was a really, really big hit. Built in the uh, Half-Life 2 engine. And if you don't know the game, you should probably look it up. It was very different from everything else, so I suspect this will also be very different. And I looked up a little bit of information on the game, and it seems to be around an hour and a half long. And it's uh, sort of a narrative where you uh, are in the mind of uh, Davy Reedon himself. He actually narrates the game, so if it's good, if it's interesting, I'll uh, play through the whole game as a let's play, because it's so short anyway. Uh, and if it's not, we'll just leave it at our first impressions. We'll see when uh, we get to the 20 minute mark or something along that line. So go out and get your favorite beverage. I already lined mine up. I have a glass of water, a cup of coffee and a two finger whiskey. So let's get started. Hi there. Thank you very much for playing the beginner's guide. My name is Davey Reedon. I wrote The Stanley Parable. And while that game tells a pretty absurd story, today I'm going to tell you about a series of events that happened between 2008 and 2011. We're going to look at the games made by a friend of mine named Coda. Now these games mean a lot to me. Uh, I met Coda in early 2009 at a time when I was really struggling with some personal stuff, and his work pointed me in a very powerful direction. I found it to be a good reference point for the kinds of creative works that I wanted to make. So just to start you off, this is, I think, the first game he ever made. It's a level for Counter-Strike. You can walk around here, by the way. And uh, mostly it's just Coda learning the basics of building a 3D environment. But what I like is that even though he starts from the simple aesthetic of a desert town, he then scatters these colorful abstract blobs and impossible floating crates around the level. And of course, it destroys the illusion that this actually is a desert town, and instead this level becomes a kind of calling card from its creator. It's like a reminder that this video game was constructed by a real person. And it kind of makes you wonder, what was going through his head as he was building this? This is what I like about all of Coda's games. I mean, not that they're all fascinating as games, but that they are all going to give us access to their creator. I want us to see past the games themselves. I want to get to know who this human being really is. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So, it's 2008, Coda starts making these games, and he never releases any of them. He doesn't put them onto the internet, he just makes them and then immediately abandons them and they sit on his computer forever. And I think he really understood this image of himself as a recluse. Uh, at one point, he jokingly renamed his computer's recycling bin to Important Games Folder. So, you know, this was just how he worked. He tended to crank them out one after the other without even really pausing to try to understand what he had just made until suddenly one day, he just stopped. In 2011, that was it. He made his last game and then he hasn't made another one since. And that's why I've taken this opportunity to gather all of his work together, is because I find his games powerful and interesting, and I'd like this collection to reach him, to maybe encourage him to start creating again. And if the people like you who play this also happen to find his work interesting, then I'm sure it'll just send that much stronger of a message of encouragement to Coda. So thanks for joining me on this. If you have a particular interpretation that I haven't mentioned here, or if you just need to get in touch, you can email me at d-a-v-e-y-w-r-e-d-e-n at gmail.com. Okay, that's about it for introduction. Let's take a look at Coda's first proper game. As each game is loading, I'll show you the date that it was completed. This first one was made in November 2008. Hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I, I I don't know, but I would think that Coda is David Raiden himself. This game is called Escape from Whisper, and it's one of the more generic games you'll see from Coda. So 
So there's not much going on here except a sense of urgency from the alarm. Security call breached. Hostile alien life form inbound. I can't aim it. It kind of looks like this game was abandoned mid development. For instance, you have this gun, which you'd think would indicate that there are supposed to be monsters or enemies somewhere, but then clearly there are no enemies anywhere. You can't even reload the gun when you run out of bullets. But ultimately, we don't really know. Maybe Coda thought that actually it was complete the way that it is. And I think that we should talk about his games for what they are, rather than for what they're not. Enemy force neutralized. Begin to shoot the door opened. I love how you can see the bottom of the universe from this room. <laughs> yeah, apparently the bottom of the universe is a square. <laughs> Who would have thought? Aesthetics pretty cool. Apparently, the space station has a labyrinth on it. I, uh, sure, I don't know. There's really no reason for it that I've ever been able to discern. So, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip you on past it. We appreciate okay, that. This is the part that's interesting. The game has this narrative about the whisper machine and how it has to be turned off, and then you get to the engine room. Hey, you there? In the engine room, you could save us all. That beam is powering the whisper machine. We could disrupt it by introducing a great enough heat signature. If you, your body could stop the beam. It's so much to ask, but for all of our lives, would you do it? Could you give yourself? That's a lot to ask, but yeah, why not? It's a video game. Let me pause here for a second. What you just experienced stepping into the beam and then dying, is probably what Coda had initially intended when he was developing this level. But when he first compiles and plays it, something goes wrong. There's a bug somewhere. And this is what happens instead. All right, so let's try again. <laughs> That's cool. the beam causes you to start floating. And this is an important moment for him. Because yes, this is technically a glitch, but Coda identifies something human about it, like how small it makes you feel in the face of this larger chaotic system. Or this floating could be the afterlife, a peaceful place juxtaposed against all of the hysteria that you've just had to traverse. I, I don't even know. Uh, I have no idea what he was thinking, but what's clear is that after making this, something lodges itself in his brain. He wants to do more of these really weird and experimental designs. So he stops work on this and moves on to a stream of tiny little games that go in all sorts of directions. Let's go ahead and take a look at the first game he made after leaving this one behind. The past was behind her. Yeah, so uh, I, st I still think that uh, we are playing through some of uh, David Reed's old games before he made the Stanley Parable. Yep. In this game, you can only walk backwards. Yeah, so we have to uh, back around here. Hit this way, I guess. <laughs> So it's a short and relatively minimalist experiment combining motion and narrative. It is less advanced than the previous game, but actually it seems to be more focused, more complete. Code is trying to give it a unique voice rather than simply basing it on a pre-existing trope. Why does the future keep changing? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. When she stops and looks, it becomes clearer. <laughs> Let's hit up this desk down here. And if the future is always behind her, how will she find the strength? It's a short little thought, it says what it wants to say, and then it ends. 
didn't need anything more than that. Which to me is why it works, because it gets out quick. Okay, next one. So the future was always behind us because we were walking backwards into the future. Makes sense. Alright, so what is this? <laughs> uh, looks like a horror game. Is something gonna jump out? You are now entering. Entering what? And that's it. Okay, the meaning of this game won't be clear just yet. Please be patient with me for a few more games and I promise you'll see what makes it interesting. Oftentimes, Koda would put bizarre titles like this one at the start of his games. <laughs> yeah. I wish I'd known him at the time that he was making these early games. He would really only talk to me about his work as he was making it. Once he stopped work on a game, like, that was it. It was dead to him. And I don't agree with that at all, but what are you gonna do? Once you've been slowed to an absolute crawl, the door at the top of the stairs opens. So why, if Code is not showing these games to anyone, why bother opening the door at all? Well, to show you, I'm modifying the game here so that when you press enter, it'll bring you back up to full speed so you can enter the door for yourself. So just press enter. <laughs> Go check out the door. The game is nothing but giant blocks of text explaining what's happening. A series of lavish a manuals. that's warm and nice and filled with little ideas for games. You must address and rally a group of eager Koda press reports. would often tell me that he didn't mind if people thought of him as cold or distant. He said that he knew that he was actually a vibrant and compassionate person but that it takes time to really see that. It can be a very slow climb to get there. Yeah. I guess you have to scrap a lot of game ideas before you arrive at the Stanley Parable. Ready, set, fish. Looks like a Parking lot or something like that. Parking garage. Well, this is new for Coda. It's an actual puzzle. Go ahead and see if you can solve it. Okay, so we can pull this. And it's dark in here and smoky. All right, let me just walk you through it. You're gonna hit the switch on the outside to open the door, then hit the same switch and walk through the door before it closes. You'll see a second switch on the inside, which will open the second door. All right, so let's do that because I was not able to solve it. Don't forget that solution because we're going to see this puzzle again soon. We're gonna see it a lot. Yes, yeah, so it turned out to be fairly simple. So that seems to be it, right? You walk down a corridor, you solve a puzzle, you get to the end. Simple enough. All right, now I'm going to modify the game again so that when you press enter, it'll remove all of the walls from this room. All right, let's press enter. What the hell? <laughs> There's a lot of rooms. How about that? There was more to it than we had any way of knowing. I actually find it funny that this game comes after the stairs game since they essentially convey the opposite idea. So uh, in the stairs game, a dull exterior concealed a rich interior. And then in this level, a dull interior hides this fantastic outer world. Either way, I think that the point is the same, is that most of the time you don't get to know what you're missing or even that you're missing anything. That's not your role as a player. So if your role here is not to understand then what is it? 
that's a good question. So now we're back here again. Exploring further. You are now exiting. Aha. Uh -huh. So this, combined with the entering game from earlier, tells us that Coda believes his games are connected somehow. It could even be that the stairs game and the puzzle game are literally connected in between this and the entering game. There's a bigger picture that all of his games are meant to play a role in, some larger meaning that we won't be able to grasp until we've seen all of them. And once we have, we can step back and start to understand what exactly that bigger picture is. Great and lovely descent. <laughs> so here's just white. And we have a really nice uh, townhouse over here, I guess. Let's talk about video game development for a second. Every video game runs on what's called an engine, which determines what the game can and cannot do. So in other words, the engine is a set of tools for game development. To make all of these games, Coda is using an engine called Source. Like all engines, Source has certain things that it does well, and it has certain things that it does poorly. One of the things that it does very well is boxy linear corridors. That's why so many of Coda's games are set in these large, flat, empty rooms, is just because he's working with what the engine does well. The tools available to the creator shape what kinds of creative work they're going to end up making. You might consider paying attention to the architecture in Coda's games, to notice how they seem to stem from an engine that's very good at producing linear, boxy corridors. And the Stanley Parable was made in Source as well, the Half-Life engine. So, uh, yeah, that's another thing pointing at uh, David Reedon as Coda. That we're actually moving through some of his old games here before maybe he made the Stanley Parable. But again, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe there really is a coda. I don't know. I don't even know if you're supposed to go down here, but I, I suppose we are. It's probably not f any kind of fall damage here. No. Let's just, just head down. Into the abyss. Of <laughs> geometric shapes in orange, white, and gray. Hmm. Let's try and hit the orange one down there. There's something on the bottom there. It's a stairwell. There's an invisible wall there. I guess it is a little bit visible. Let's just head out here. Ah, that looks pretty cool, actually. Alright, so we'll head this way. I guess he wants us to go through here as well. This prison, funny enough, in Coda's original design, the door stayed shut for a full hour before letting you go. If you don't mind, I think we're gonna skip that. This is something that he and I used to argue about a lot. You know, whether a game ought to actually be playable, whether it means anything if no one can get through it. And I would always defend that, you know, all this work goes into the game, why not make it playable and accessible? And so we just got into heated arguments over it. And there was one time that after one of these conversations, he went home and a day or two later, he sent me a zip file entitled Playable Games that was full of hundreds of individual games, each of which was just an empty box that you walked around in and nothing else. Believe me, I played every single one of those just to find out if there was like a gag hidden somewhere. There wasn't.
It's the puzzle again, with the exact same solution as the last time. Let's wait for the door to close. Ah, we have to close it like that. Here we go. There's still no clear indication of what makes this puzzle so special that Coda is going to return to it over and over. But I promise I'll share with you my interpretation very shortly. I think most of these environments are actually quite interesting. You there, did you come up from above? Here, Coda begins using a kind of dialogue system that he fashioned out of the engine's chat capabilities. Use the one, two, three buttons on your keyboard to respond. What was up there? Well, I can either say, yes, there was a world stamped with whiteness, or two, yes, there was an enormous prison I spent hours in, or three, yes, there was floating colored blocks. Let's say three. That's the world above. You've been there. Now this is important. Did you have to get through a puzzle with two doors and switches? Yes, I did. That was literally the last thing I did before coming here. Let's say that. Again, perfect. Now please tell us how you solved this. <laughs> tell us the solution. Tell us how to get to the other side. Let's say free, trust me, you don't want to go over there. Oh no, but I do, we do. We need to get there. Do you understand? It is the most important thing in the world. We have to escape this prison. There must be an ending. I promise you there is nothing I want more. Alright, there's another door opened over there, I think. There's a sound. Hello, how did you get here? Was there a puzzle you had to pass through? So it's the same question. Yes. Do you want to know how to solve it? No, no, we actually find the black space between the doors to be far more interesting. Have you seen it? Yes. Yeah, let's say two. Actually, now that you mention it, I remember feeling strange as I passed through it. Don't think too hard about it. You'll see it again soon. So the door opened over here. And so we make one last descent down to the final floor of the level. at the end of the tunnel. It's a suburban square. It's a lamppost. Okay, I can't tell you quite why, but for some reason, Coda fixates on this lamppost. It's going to appear at the end of every single one of his games from here on out. I'll tell you what I think. Uh, I think that up to this point, you know, he's been making really strange and abstract games with no clear purpose, and maybe you can only float around in that headspace for so long. Because now he wants something to hold on to. He wants a reference point. He wants the work to be leading to something. He wants a destination, which is what this lamppost is. It's a destination. We're gonna see it in the work as well. His games are just gonna become a lot more cohesive, a lot more fully developed, with more of a clear idea behind them. And as we go, that idea will get clearer, clearer and clearer. 